So welcome everyone to uh, this um, most recent constitutional conversation uh, sponsored by the Stanford Law School Constitutional Law Center. Uh, I'm Michael McConnell, most of you uh, know me, and it's exciting to see such a large uh, group uh, gathered for our topic tonight. Uh, I don't blame you because I think it's an especially exciting, it's in the newspapers almost every day. Uh, the tone is a little different. Uh, Donald Trump's uh, executive orders were greeted uh, with a lot of boos and a lot of yays, and Biden's are exactly the same, only his are viewed, greeted with a lot of yays and a lot of boos, and hardly anybody is doing the same. But um, we're not going to be talking about policy. We're not going to be talking about whether these are good ideas or bad ideas. We're going to be talking tonight about constitutional authority. And one might think that the same rules apply uh, for authority, whether to presidents we like, as well as to presidents that we uh, uh, dislike. And uh, our guests tonight uh, will help us, I hope, uh, sort through that. Uh, both of them are old friends of mine. Uh, um, Michael Paulson, uh, who is a, the what distinguished university chair in constitutional law at St. Thomas uh, in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, and uh, David Strauss, who we were junior, we were newly minted junior professors at the University of Chicago back in the middle 1980s, and he has stayed there as I keep wandering from place to place. Uh, uh, he is the Gerald Ratner public service professor at University of Chicago Law School. And both of them teach all kinds of constitutional law, but are especially interested in issues of um, executive power and separation of powers. Both of them uh, in their past served as lawyers in the Office of Legal Counsel, which is the portion of the Department of Justice, which uh, uh, is in charge of internal uh, constitutional questions of that sort. So without any uh, more ado, I will uh, uh, turn over to the two of them. Uh, both will speak for, I guess, about 15 minutes, and then we will begin more conversationally with uh, questions and comments from you, the audience. Uh, please put them into the chat, and uh, Morgan will uh, uh, field them to the uh, to our guests. So welcome, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Here, I'm in my basement in Minneapolis, <laughs> but I'm here in spirit. Uh, I'm, it's always glad to be back, so to speak, at Stanford Law School. I count Stanford as my alma mater, even though I didn't graduate. I had the misfortune of graduating from Yale Law School, but I am a distinguished Stanford Law School dropout. I know, you, here, here's what happened. I arrived in the fall of 1981 and it lasted just about a few weeks. I, I couldn't bear it, the sunshine, the daiquiri parties, the hot tubs, it was just too much to bear. So I eventually dropped out and I've, I did eventually graduate from a semi-distinguished law school, except for the professors, Yale. So you can think of Yale as a place where Stanford dropouts go as their fallback position. I'm also honored to be here with my good friends, old friends, David Strauss and Michael McConnell, who I've known, I count for 37 years, we met in the summer of 1984. They were young assistants to the Solicitor General in the Solicitor General's Office of the Department of Justice. And I was a lowly meager summer law clerk, just sort of awed by the brilliance of my colleagues, Strauss and McConnell. A few others I've kept in touch with, John Garvey, who's now president of Catholic University, a guy named Sam Alito, who in addition to his legal talents, was by far the best hitter and fielder on the Solicitor General's office summer softball team. So I've known these guys for 37 years. It's great to be here and be with them. Um, when Michael asked me way back in November to be on this, he sent me an email and let me just sort of read you what he wrote. Michael, I would like to put together a program on executive orders, the constitutional issues. Would you be able to do that and interested? I'm thinking of pairing you with a left of center person. I guess I'm the right of center person and David is the left of center person. 
So here was my response. I'm gonna try the screen share function and see if I can pull it up here. I just copied it into a Word document. I said, I'm game, tell me more. When? Zoom? And then I had this sort of audacious suggestion that I knew what I was talking about. I said, I have a fairly well-formulated theory of executive orders. And I put them in scare quotes. The issuance of such orders is not a freestanding power of the president. There's no power to issue executive orders. Executive orders are a method, a means of carrying out other powers of the president, commander in chief and foreign affairs powers or other independent presidential constitutional powers like the pardon power, internal executive branch administration, supervision, direction powers, independent presidential law interpretation authority and delegated law execution powers. And here's the punchline. Executive orders are lawful when they properly fit within one of these categories. They are unlawful when they don't. The scope of each of these presidential powers is contestable, of course, but that is where the contest should take place not over the question of the validity of executive orders in the abstract. The relevant question is the scope of presidential powers in a given context, not the mode in which those powers are carried out. Now, I think that pretty much exhausts my reservoir, my very limited stock of insightful things to say about executive orders, is that executive orders, in concept, there's nothing wrong with them. They are merely a means or a method of implementing other presidential powers. And that's where the true dispute rises. Disputes over various executive orders are not about the use of executive orders per se. Executive orders are just an instrument. They are disputes about the underlying presidential powers being exercised or over the true scope of the statutory delegations that are claimed to authorize such orders. They're disputes over presidential power or the disputes over whether the thought power that is claimed to have been delegated has in fact been delegated. That's really all I have to say. I'm gonna run through a couple of illustrations of this through by looking at five of the probably the most famous or some infamous executive orders in US constitutional history. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, Franklin Roosevelt's Japanese internment executive order. It was actually just sort of a general military order about protection against sabotage and invasion and domestic uh, surveillance. Those are the orders that gave rise to the infamous decisions in the Hirabayashi and Korematsu cases. Then the Truman Steel Seizure Executive Order, which was the source of the constitutional argument that led to the famous Supreme Court decision in the Young Sound Sheet and Tube Company case. President Carter's Iranian hostage deal executive order and Trump's infamous travel ban and other executive orders. I'm gonna spend about two minutes on each one just sort of fleshing out my thesis that executive orders themselves are not the issue. The issue was always the underlying presidential power that is being claimed. Let's we'll start with Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which is probably the most famous, most stunning, most sweeping, most constitutionally significant, most historically important executive order of all time. Now at the time, Lincoln was accused by some, and some accuse him even today, of legislating that the Emancipation Proclamation, the order freeing slaves in the rebel South was an act of usurpation of congressional power. I think that's wrong because I think it was within the scope of the president's military power of commander in chief in time of armed conflict with an enemy force or power to appropriate or confiscate to free what was at the time regarded as enemy materiel or property. But notice that that is a dispute over the scope of the presidential commander in chief clause power. It is not a problem of the executive orders, but the scope of the commander in chief clause power. The real question is, is this act within the scope of presidential power? 
for the Emancipation Proclamation, I think it was, and the fact that it was issued by an executive order itself is essentially immaterial. Similarly, the validity or not of FDR's Executive Order 9066, which led to the Japanese internment, is not a question of the validity of issuing executive orders because it's clearly within the commander in chief clause power to issue military orders during time of war. The question is the substantive constitutionality of the orders actually given and whether you can round up civilian non-combatants and hold them in essentially the American equivalent of concentration camps. In other words, the problem is not with the form, but with the substance. Consider Truman's order seizing the nascent steel mills at the at time of Korean War in order to avert a labor strike. Truman issued this command by executive order. He, he directed his Secretary of Commerce to take control to seize the nation's steel mills and to keep them operating so that steel production would keep going in time of war. This really is the classic illustration, I think, of a president legislating by executive order. And it led to the Supreme Court's famous set of opinions in Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer, where the Supreme Court held that the president may not legislate by executive order. There's your stake in the ground fundamental principle. The president may not legislate by executive order. The president only has authority where he's either one exercising one of his specific constitutional powers or secondly is acting pursuant to an authorization by an act of Congress. The court in the Youngstown case found that Truman's steel seizure order was authorized by neither of these things. It was not within the commander in chief clause power. It was not within any inherent presidential power and it was not authorized by act of Congress. Again, the problem of the unconstitutionality of that particular executive order was that it was substantively unauthorized, not that it came in the form of an executive order. Fourth example, this comes from my youth and the, when Jimmy Carter was president and one of the most memorable events of the time was the Iranian hostage crisis. Carter froze Iranian assets and many US companies filed claims against those assets and were obtaining judicial judgments in the process. When Carter negotiated an executive agreement procuring the release of the American hostages, he not only unfroze the Iranian assets, which he had a delegated authority to do, but by executive order extinguished the legal claims against those assets held by certain American businesses and companies. That, in, in my humble opinion, really was a violation of the Youngstown principle in that the president was legislating by executive order. Of course, the Supreme Court upheld this. What are they gonna do? In the infamous case of Dames and Moore versus Regan, they upheld the validity of this executive order. Again, though, the question is not the form in which the order took. The question is the substantive validity and that's a legitimate dispute over not executive orders themselves, but over the scope of the foreign affairs power and whether the foreign affairs power to reach executive agreements includes a power to alter the domestic legal rights of individuals and companies. And then there's Trump. Now, put to one side Trump's ridiculous, ludicrous, constitutionally ignorant, dangerously incompetent claims of total authority. I'm the president, I have total authority, I can do whatever I want. Put that to one side for a second. Also put to one side, if you can, Trump's sometimes malevolent motives like behind his Muslim ban. You know, he's saying he was out to get Muslims in particular. Put those aside and consider the substance of some of his seemingly most outrageous outlandish executive orders. And I think that many of them were plausibly justifiable legally from a legal standpoint 
as authorized by broad sweeping delegations of authority by Congress. The travel ban, for example, was authorized by a statute, and I have, have it here with me, 8 U.S. Code Section 1182F, concerning suspension of entry or imposition of restrictions by president, it gave Trump and any other president the authority to restrict immigration and travel. Listen to what it says. Whenever the president finds that the entry of any aliens or of any class of aliens into the United States would be detrimental to the interests of the United States, he may, by proclamation, and for such period as he shall deem necessary, suspend the entry of all aliens or any class of aliens as immigrants or non-immigrants or impose on the entry of any aliens any restrictions he may deem to be appropriate. The problem with Trump's executive order, aside from its motives, was the broad delegation of authority. What Trump's order did was exercise broad authority conferred on him by Congress. You can look at some of Trump's other executive orders and reach similar conclusions. For example, his notorious reprogramming of funds to build his border wall was plausibly justified by a tendentious reading of certain emergency exceptions contained in statutes providing for defense appropriations. The problem is that the term emergency is essentially undefined and it enabled the president by virtue of the broad delegation to do what he wanted and get away with it legally. Finally, I don't know how many of you remember this, but there was some point in I think 2019 when Trump in the midst of his on again, off again trade wars with China issued by tweet an order, something to the effect of, I hereby order our great American companies to start looking for an alternative to dealing with China. And the question was, can the president order American companies to cease doing business with China? And the fact is he can under a statute called the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, IEPA, which confers huge discretion upon the president to take actions that he thinks are necessary to respond to any unusual or extraordinary threat to the nation's national security, foreign policy, or economy. And it gives the president broad authority. In short, in many of these instances, the problem is not with the executive order. The problem is with the sweeping delegation. In fact, I would go so far to say that, as to say that there is nothing wrong with the phenomenon of executive orders in and of themselves. The problem, if there is one, is delegation of broad authority that gives the president the power to do whatever he chooses to do. The problem is one of excessive concentration of power in the executive as a practical matter, as a result of Congress giving away the store. And the problem is one of how you rein in presidential government and rein in presidential abuses of power. The problem is abuse and concentration of presidential power, not executive orders themselves. Um, well, my thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks, Michael McConnell, my, uh, my old friend, I have a an Italian friend who is always very careful um, because he's attuned to the ambiguities of English to refer to me as my friend from the old times as opposed to my old friend because that has another meaning. Um, so Michael, my friend from old times, Mike Paulson, great to see you and thanks to Morgan and the center for setting this up for inviting me. Um, I don't really, I guess I was supposed to be the person from the from the more left side and Mike from the more right side, I don't, I don't really have a lot to disagree with what he said. I think it's very sensible. I think it's right. The president has the powers that he has given to him either by the constitution or by statute. And he can't enlarge those powers by issuing something called an executive order or by issuing something called a proclamation or something called a memorandum or a tweet, all of which are ways of 
saying what the president thinks about something. And I don't know whether tweets are a way of exercising his authority under a statute grants him authority or under one of the constitutional revisions that does, but the others certainly could be. Um, and the form in which he does it doesn't matter very much. As Mike said, what matters is what authority does he have? And that's a question of interpreting either the statute or in some instances, a provision of the constitution like the commander in chief power or the pardon power. So I think all of that is pretty clearly right. And then the question is, well, then if, if that's so straightforward, and, and you know, not what, what's going on? Why are those these, these executive orders? Why have why does it seem to strike people that executive orders are something more than that, or something more powerful than that, or different from that, or something that raises different issues? And I, there's there are a couple things to be said about that. One is pretty straightforward. I think that the executive order is a way for the president to put his imprimatur on an issue to announce his position on an issue, to identify with the issue, even though the, the actual legally operative step will be taken by an executive department. So for example, um, DACA and DAPA, President Obama's, uh, the, I almost, I mean, there's an example of my falling into the trap that Mike Paulson tried to keep us out of. The DAPA and DACA and Obama administration programs dealing with um, undocumented immigrants, or the so-called dreamers in one case, and uh, parents of Americans in the other case. Those were Obama administration actions, but the legal action was taken by the Department of Homeland Security. Now, President Obama issued statements, I believe actually executive orders, but in any, in any event, statements on his own behalf, putting himself behind those actions to establish what his position was. But then the action was taken by the secretary of DHS. And that was the person who was the defendant in the actions and it was treated legally as an act of DHS. So that's one thing that executive orders do is for the president to identify with the policy position that his administration is taken. The other thing that executive orders purport to do is to direct members of the administration to take these actions. And that I think raises some interesting issues and that's sort of what I wanna get into. And it is, um, it's in a way tangential to the things Mike Paulson said, although totally consistent with what he says. And, and there I got, I have a couple of quotations and my apologies if they're, um, if they're cliches and you've heard them all before, but I think they are in some ways keys to this question of what's going on when the president issues an executive order that tells the executive branch to do something. One is an exchange from Shakespeare's Henry IV part one, uh, where um, two people who are in rebellion against uh, Henry IV, a Hotspur, a sensible Englishman, and Glendower, a Welsh mystic. Um, they're both in rebellion, but they're competitors, and they meet, and Glendower, the mystic, carries on for a while about his mystical powers, and Hotspur tries to deflate him, and at one point, Glendower says, I can summon spirits from the vasty deep, and Hotspur says, well, so can I, but will they come? So that kind of is part of what is going on. I mean, sure, the president can issue executive orders and executive orders and executive orders, but if the members of his administration say, you know, thanks for your views and do what they want to do, what happens to that executive order? It just sits there in the federal register unless something, the president does something else like fire the administrator in charge. And the other quotation, again, something you may have heard is something that Harry Truman apparently said about um, about Eisenhower succeeding him in office in Truman's last weeks in office when he knew Eisenhower was going to be a successor. Eisenhower, of course, had been the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. And uh, Truman said, you know, Ike, Ike being Eisenhower is going to sit behind his desk and, and he's, he's going to find that this isn't anything like the army because he's going to say, do this, do that, and nothing will happen. And uh, a friend of Eisenhower said, the only thing Truman got wrong when he said that is that's exactly like the army. Um, so there's, I mean, so that's the question is whether an executive order amounts to saying anything more than pretty please um, in these instances in which Congress or a statute or the constitution has not vested authority in the president 
which are many of these instances, many of the Biden executive orders are like that. As Mike said, some of the ones he mentioned and many of the Trump executive orders also like that. Um, are they anything more than pretty please? That actually raises an issue that seems to be settled, although it's not 100% um, not obvious as a matter of first principles that it should have gotten settled in the way it's settled. And the issue is this, it, supposing Congress passes a statute that vests the power to do something in a subordinate executive officer and the head of the cabinet department, say the administrator of EPA or the secretary of defense, the secretary of, of, um, of the interior, some, someone like that, can the president say, listen, the executive power is vested in me. Congress can't carve it up and give a chunk of it to someone else. I'm gonna exercise that power. Sure, Congress said that the administrator of EPA has to issue this water pollution regulation. I, I, the administrator is dragging her heels. I'm gonna issue it uh, in the form I want because the executive power is vested in me, uh, essentially seizing the pen from the uh, person to whom Congress has given it. Now, it seems there's actually a, a sort of dueling set of attorney general opinions on this that are discussed very illuminatingly in Michael McConnell's book. I'm gonna plug this book the way they do on late night TV. Um, only this, unlike books on late night TV, you really should get this one. This is a book of Michael's that recently came out. Uh, buy this book, Mike, Mike Paulson has it too. Uh, buy this book, it's great um, and read it carefully. Um, and Michael has a way of reconciling his apparently dueling attorney general opinions on that question, whether the president can actually exercise power that's been granted to a subordinate official and say, you know, I, forget, forget the administrative EPA, I am signing this, um, issuing this regulation. Uh, and the established principle is he cannot, that he can, he can fire the head of EPA or someone else who doesn't have tenure and uh, tenure protections. Uh, he can fire that person and try to appoint someone who will do what he wants, but he can't exercise the power himself. And that again suggests that maybe executive orders amount, except when the president is granted authority by the constitution or statute, uh, executive orders just amount to saying, pretty please. There are some interesting issues here because in a lot of the opinions that talk about presidential power and particularly about the president's power to fire members of the executive branch, cabinet heads and other uh, executive officers, talk about the president, how the president has to be able to supervise and control the executive branch. And there's a question of what that means. Now, of course it means if the person doesn't have tenure and salary protections or if those protections are not constitutional, he can fire the person. But as anyone who's ever run any kind of organization knows, being able to fire people is a very crude way of running things. Um, uh, can the president do more? And the president cannot just say, I don't care what you do, I'm going to do it. Um, in certain circumstances, well, specifically in the military, of course, the president can issue an order that is legally binding and the person in the military has to obey it. If they don't, that's a crime, um, but that's a special case. Um, there's one more story. Uh, um, there's a, during the Watergate uh, matter, uh, when uh, the president was implicated in the cover-up of a burglary of his political opponent's headquarters, uh, there was a special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, who investigated the break-in. Cox uh, subpoenaed tapes of White House conversations. President uh, Nixon uh, didn't want to comply with the subpoena. Uh, Nixon ordered the attorney general, who was the only person with the power to fire the special prosecutor, to fire him. The attorney general resigned, refused to do it, and resigned. Uh, the president then ordered the deputy attorney general to do it. And in the course of this, the president's, uh, Nixon's chief of staff, a fellow named Alexander Haig, who had been a general in the army, had been before he became chief of staff, said to the deputy attorney general, your commander in chief has given you an order. Well, the president is not the commander in chief of the civilian workforce. He's the commander in chief of the army and navy. Um, and the deputy attorney general also resigned, an option not available to a corporal who was told, storm that machine gun emplacement. That person can't say, no thanks, I'm resigning. Um, but the deputy attorney general can. So there's an instance in which the orders are binding. Otherwise, um, there's a sort of a question, I suppose, whether that whether executive branch officials have an 
oath of office duty to comply with presidential orders. That is to say they should comply or resign. Um, they can't just uh, disobey them and um, refuse to comply and wait for the president to fire them if he is willing to. There's a question about that, whether they have an obligation to do that. But otherwise, um, they uh, can stand pat and force the president to fire them. And all executive order can do is to say, please, will you do this? And with an implicit threat, I will fire you if you don't. But that's a costly step for a president to take. Um, OK, so what do we make of all of this and the significance of executive orders beyond saying pretty please and announcing the president's views on a subject that his inferiors have to implement? Here is something that I think is a little bit under the radar, but a potentially significant development about executive orders is that increasingly, I think this is true, uh, certainly true of Trump, uh, increasingly, people are suing to challenge executive orders, even when they are not in Mike Paulson's categories of things where the president is exercising his own power. So the president says, I want the secretary of HHS to do something. Here's an order. Um, uh, and people sue right away, as they did with some of the Trump orders directed to executive departments. Uh, that raises some potentially some difficult questions um, it, on two fronts. Number one is what, what exactly is that, what, what exactly do we do with that lawsuit? This is not a legally effective step until it is followed by a member of the executive branch. So is it not ripe? Do we have to wait for it to be carried out? Can the suit not go forward right ahead, right away? Um, and because the president is not an agency, not subject to the Administrative Procedure Act, exactly what standard of review applies to that action by the president. Those are two murky questions. And I think with the proliferation of executive orders precisely because presidents want to put themselves on record, we're gonna see more of those, more of that litigation, which will raise these questions. The other thing I think will, is likely to, to or could happen is, it is the, the line between Mike Paulson's two categories. Is the president authorized to do this or is this something where a cabinet head or the equivalent has to do it. That can be blurry. It can be unclear whether this uh, is authority that the president can exercise by himself. And the more we get litigation challenging executive orders, the more things we put in that category of presidential action because the people challenging them want them to be in that category. They want to be able to say, no, no, the president did something effective and I want to sue him right now. And in the Trump situation, Part of what is going on there is they don't, and this, this happened to some extent with the, with the travel ban in a, in a way, they don't want the president's action, which in Trump's case was tainted by his bigoted statements about Muslims. They don't want that to get laundered through the bureaucracy and made more acceptable. They really want to capture the president's action because by the time the national security bureaucracy takes hold of that presidential order, and it took three iterations. By the time they take hold of it and they build a record, they explain what they're doing and they modify it and they refine it, it is much more defensible for the government than when it looks like a simple exercise of the president's whims. Um, so I think we're likely with the proliferation of executive orders, I think we might see things increasingly being pushed toward uh, saying the president has authority to do things in questionable circumstances under the, some of the statutes Mike Paulson mentioned, like the uh, uh, International Emergency Economic Powers Act that are, it's unclear what the scope of the president's authority is. You have a situation where everyone wants to make it a matter of presidential authority. The government does uh, because it's presidential authority. The people suing him do because they want to latch onto things he has said before it can be turned into more acceptable form by relatively apolitical people in the, um, in the government. So I can see that. Uh, I can see that being a trend and probably an unfortunate trend. Plus one more point about executive orders and is if the president's not exercising his own power, is this any more than saying pretty please? Um, is this, uh, and I'm not 100% confident about this because I don't have enough firsthand experience to know, but I think this is right. You know, people say, uh, it's a, a cliche almost, that Congress is a, is a they, not a, an it. Don't look for the intent of Congress. There's no such thing. It's 
a whole bunch of different people. But to some extent, that's true of the, of the president too, or the presidency, that we think of the president as being a unitary actor. But of course, inside the executive branch, acting in the name of the president are a bunch of different power centers, sometimes seeking to get the president to sign off on something, sometimes just to have some action taken, and then it's a fait accompli. So they battle for, um, for position. Uh, and the, what the president quote unquote does is really the result of these internal bureaucratic battles inside the executive branch. I think one thing an executive order does is to empower the White House in its dealings with the cabinet, the White House staff. So the president will issue an order, which of course is written by someone else. And then people in the White House dealing with possibly recalcitrant cabinet agencies, people in the cabinet departments who may have different views. You know, you're in Department of Defense, you have your own view about a military discipline or troop deployments. You're in EPA, you have your own views about the environment. You're in the Department of the Interior, you have your own views about managing federal lands that might not be the same as the views that come out of the White House. An executive order gives the people in the White House the ability internally to go to those cabinet departments and say, the president has spoken, here's what he said is written it down in detail, you have to follow this. And, you know, dismissal, firing people is really beside the point. These people, they're playing on the same team. Um, they don't, you know, they, they don't wanna be seen as disloyal to the team. They don't wanna be seen as giving aid and comfort to the other side. So that is a powerful way within the executive branch, internal fights to empower people in the White House to say, I am speaking for the president, I don't, you don't have to take my word for it. It's written down here. And I wonder whether that isn't a big part of what's going on and why we see this proliferation of executive orders in addition to the public relations um, effectiveness, because it is a way for people on the president's staff close to the president to get him to put his name on something that they can then go to people further removed from the White House and make sure that they do what the people in the White House want them to do, which is a, a tension in, in every administration. So I suspect that in addition to the public relations effect um, is what's really going on in, the, in Mike Paulson's category where these are not legally effective orders. And the, the, the potential uh, problem I see is a problem of premature litigation precipitated by the issuance of these, uh, these orders. Thank you both uh, for your remarks. We have tons of questions from our audience. So I'm gonna dive right in and uh, the two of you can answer them. You can each answer or you can take, take turns however you'd like. Um, sort of building David on your discussion of EOs as asking pretty please, one of our audience members asks, well, what about the converse of that? What if an executive order is followed but the president didn't actually have the power or the substantive provisions themselves were unconstitutional. Presumably the question here is what happens, what might the remedy be in that situation? Well, if the president orders or uh, beseeches a um, cabinet department or administrative agency to do something that turns out to be illegal, that can be challenged um, under the APA or challenged as, uh, as unconstitutional. And then the agency action will be set aside. And the executive order will sit out there, but it will, you know, it will it will lose its credibility. Um, but what will the, the litigation will take the form of uh, a sort of routine um, action against the administrative agency and avoid some of the difficulties that come into play when you're when you're suing the president or challenging a a, a presidential action. Stepping back, uh, Mike, did you want to? Jump in on this one. Uh, no, I, I, my comment would was more directed to David's comments. Um, I have always assumed in my discussion of executive orders that the executive is a single entity, that the executive power, also Article 2 begins with the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. So I am of very much of the view that the presidency is a unitary branch and everybody who works for the administration is a subordinate of the president. So that what the executive president commands is the command, it is the decision of the executive branch. So I'd never 
there, there might be very fine points of difference in terms of the application of the Administrative Procedure Act and when something becomes reviewable. But in terms of constitutional structure, I'm strongly of the view of presidential executive supremacy. For better or for worse, the president calls the shots within the administration and speaks for the administration. So in my discussion, I assume that when the president issues an executive order to directed to a cabinet agency or a subordinate agency, that actually can become and constitutionally is the action of the executive branch. So just to be, to be clear, um, if Congress says the administrative EPA shall issue pollutions governing, uh, regulations governing water pollution, um, the, uh, the president can issue those regulations and they will be just as valid as if they were issued by the head of EPA? Yes, I think the president can direct, the president can control, the president can hire and fire, the president can countermand, and I think the president can stand in the shoes of the EPA administrator that when Congress specifies that the EPA administrator should, doing, should do a certain thing, uh, Congress is saying that the administration should do it. Fun constitutionally, they have vested a power in a subordinate agency of the executive branch and the subordinate must answer to the president and be subject to the president's plenary direction and control. And then, so the question of the lawfulness of executive branch agencies actions is a question of the lawfulness of what the executive has done, including the president's actions supervening or contravening the actions of subordinates. Okay, but just to make this operative, what you're saying is Andrew Jackson really could have saved himself a lot of trouble just by withdrawing the money from the bank himself and not firing a couple people to get there. He really just, I mean, yeah, Andrew Jackson, uh, of all people, had too modest the conception of his own role. The power to fire subordinates who do not do your will is, I think, an ancillary power to the core executive power to direct and control the actions of the executive branch. So in a so technical in, sense, yes. He blew it. I don't know. I don't he know made if life he much more it, difficult but, for himself than, but, he could, than he needed to. Yeah, I don't know if he fit, he could have directed that the subordinates remove the action. Uh, yeah, but that's Henry the Fourth. That's Henry the Fourth. I it can is. summon and spirits it, and, from the And if they TV. don't do it, I mean, the, the power to fire and discharge is the power to enforce your commands within the- Only exam. if you're willing to fire, which in real life often is not enough. I mean, often the president won't be on big issues, sure. But on lots of issues, that someone or someone, the president or someone acting in the president's name, might say, don't do that or do that. And they drag their feet and they don't do it for a while and they only go halfway. You're not gonna fire the person because they didn't quite do what you wanted. Um, so the power to fire, I get, but but anyway, we should let more questions come in. Yes. We should continue this conversation, it's very interesting. Sort, sort of related, I think, to the discussion you're having. One of our audience members asks, you know, re recognizes that agencies are of course part of the executive branch, but perhaps executive orders can be used to circumvent the rulemaking procedures of the APA. And I wonder, Mike, if this, maybe I'm, if one of the implications of what you were saying is that, yeah, they can, they can go ahead and circumvent a way that's totally fine. Would, would that flow from the theory that you were just outlining or would you perhaps answer that question differently? I think I'll bite the bullet and answer it the same way. I'm not sure. I would have to review the requirements of the Administrative Procedure Act, but I think in principle, Congress cannot micromanage how the executive conducts the executive branch's affairs. So in principle, the president could do a workaround. I think it would still be subject to whatever administrative law checks and balances exist and to evaluate the lawfulness of agency action. But I think the president can substitute his will for that of the subordinate agency. Um, I would just say, I mean, I think Mike has followed out the implications of his view and it's pretty dramatic view. It would mean that any time the president doesn't, I mean, given the existence of the law, which is that the president's not subject to the requirements of the APA, if the president wants, if there's some agency action the president does want, it have to go through notice and comment, the president could just issue it in his own name and that's that. So as far as the notice and comment 
concern about DAPA, for example, President Obama could just have issued his own name and poof, notice and comment goes away, which, I mean, could that is an implication of you and you're, you're holding to the view um, very coherently, but I think that's an example of just what a dramatic change it would be in uh, the way we think about administrative agencies. It would all be a question of what exactly is the scope of authority conferred by Congress's delegation in the statute and whether that extends to presidential actions substituting for the subordinate executive officials or not. Yeah. I, th I think you've retreated. I mean, it wouldn't depend at all on what Congress has done. Congress cannot take the power away from the president. The president chooses to say, I'm issuing that regulation. The president can do that. Whatever right. the cabinet officer in whom the authority is vested has to say about the question. I I'm saying that the question of whether Congress could impose upon the president as a condition of the exercise of delegated power and notice and comment period, and whether you should construe the, the uh, requirement as extending to him is a separate question from the president's ability to countermand and direct the actions of his subordinates. Agreed. So switching gears a little bit from the discussion that we're having to the mode within which executive orders are sort of effectuated. Um, one of our audience members notes that they're typically published in the Federal Register and asks if presidents really can do the same thing over Twitter, of course, invoking, referring back to um, President Trump, Trump's practices, and also asks, what if Congress had given the president the power to, exec to exercise the power by, by proclamation? Is it possible to effectuate executive orders in this way? Uh, yeah, I think the short of it is that the president can exercise executive authority through any measure he, through any method he wishes to do so, right? It, whatever, you know, the, the federal register is one communications tool and not a very good one. Twitter is another communications tool and a highly effective, dangerous, deadly one. But I think that the exercise of presidential commands and directives and the excess, the form in which they take is not material. Okay. Um, related, we have sort of a, a definitional question about executive orders. Um, Looking at the Legal Information Institute, it defines executive orders the following way. So bear with me as I read this to you. An executive order is a declaration by the president or a governor, which has the force of law, usually based on existing statutory powers. They do not require any action by the Congress or state legislature to take effect, and the legislature cannot overturn them. Is that wrong? David, do you want that or should I take a first stab? Well, I think I would just be carrying out the theory you've said in your opening remarks, which is if it is an exercise of a constitutional power given to the president, then it has the force of law and then Congress can't do anything about it. If it's an exercise of a statutory power, Congress almost certainly could um, override it. I mean, there might be some retroactivity concern uh, in that circumstance, but the Congress, the president's exercising power given to by Congress Congress can take it away, um, modulo uh, re retroactivity concerns. But as far as the force of law, a lot of these things, in my view at least, and this might be a place where this implicates the disagreement Mike and I had a minute ago, um, a lot of them don't have anything I would call the force of law. They are, they are um, requests to people who have the authority to exercise the authority in a certain way. And if the people say, you know, thanks, uh, Mr. President, but um, I'm going my own way, which they will say more subtly than that, um, the executive order will just sit there unimplemented. Yeah, I, I think I agree completely with David. I think that the question of the, <clears throat> whether the Legal Information Institute, what is, is it, what? <laughs> the Legal Information Institute. Okay. I'm always wary whenever my <laughs> students are quoting Wikipedia, the Legal Information Institute, or Black's Law Dictionary, because it is hard to condense executive orders into a single comprehensive definition that's precise. I think the short of it is that some executive orders have the force of law, where they are presidential implementation of delegated 
uh, statutory authority. Other presidential executive orders have the force of law by virtue of being the instantiation of presidential power, like a pardon, uh, like a military command, and that some presidential executive orders do not strictly speaking have the force of law, but are directives for internal administration. And in David's view, that's saying pretty please. And in my view, that's saying it is so ordered within the executive branch. And that's just a disagreement about what the, what the force is within the executive branch. But neither one of them really has the force of law in the sense in which your Legal Information Institute definition uses the term. A quick uh, sort of departure related to that definition which brought in the role of governors, um, which sort of adds a wrinkle to our discussion since we had been focusing on the president. Um, one of our audience members asks, um, do the limitations on executive orders also apply to state governors? For example, where does California's state governor, Gavin Newsom, get the authority to force businesses to close or to force people to wear masks? Perhaps these orders should only apply to employees of the executive branch. These are questions of California state law of which I am blissfully ignorant. Uh, I was visiting professor at Pepperdine in some of my last semester when the, uh, when the pandemic broke and some of my former students wrote to me and say, can Governor Newsom do this? Did you, you know, how does what we taught us in constitutional law apply here? I say, I only know a little bit about federal constitutional law. You would have to read the California constitution and look at the statutes to see whether the governor can do that. Or not. I don't know, Morgan, you're sitting there in California. Do you know the answer to this? I Michael, don't. <laughs> Michael I McConnell, don't. <laughs> can we call on Michael McConnell? <laughs> I, do, I do not know the answer. Um, okay. Um, Moving back to the federal executive, I thought, as we are now rounding out almost to our six o'clock hour, we have a question um, that's pretty timely. Um, someone asks about the unprecedented number of executive orders that President Biden has has issued. And, in, and another one of our audience members actually sent us a link to a news article about another executive order that's likely to come out tomorrow um, about curbing gun violence. And I think our audience is interested in understanding where do most of these executive orders stand in terms of their legality, um, their constitutionality, and whether or not this is a, a good a good practice, what we're seeing out of the administration in the, in the first couple of months? I think there are two things going on there. One is the kind of wanting to elevate an issue, to make an issue his own, uh, to take a stand, a very visible stand on an issue, which you do by saying publicly what you otherwise might do by just internal communication or, or not having to say anything because the people you've brought into your administration agree with you and they're gonna to try to implement these programs anyway. So in that sense, an executive order is unnecessary because they know what they're supposed to do. Um, but I also think it has the effect of galvanizing uh, action within the executive branch. It's a way of telling people in the executive branch, get moving on this, get moving on this fast because if you don't, you can expect a call from my chief of staff saying, what's going on? We issued an executive order. What progress have you made? Where are the regulations? Where's the action? Which is something that, you know, simply a plank in a party platform or even a, even a presidential speech might not galvanize action in that way. The concern, I, the, the, there might be a couple of concerns. I mean, there's sort of obviously concerns about raising an issue politically. Um, I do kind of worry about precipitating litigation. If someone, the, the, the audience member who asked this question, you know, no doubt people who are opposed to the administration's programs are asking the same questions and would be tempted to sue on the basis of the executive order. And I, I think that, I think the system is not supposed to work that way and it could produce distortions in the system if that happens. Now, maybe it's worth it because of the gains I mentioned, but I, I do see that as a, uh, in fact, I, I guess it is, I think it is worth it, but I do see that with a potential concern with the proliferation of executive orders. Uh, just a couple of quick add-ons to what David said. You know, I think the number of executive orders matters not a bit. 
right? The question is, are these, is each of these executive orders within the lawful scope of the president's power or delegated authority or not? And as to, you know, I have no idea what Biden is going to be saying about gun violence, but I could just think out loud with you, it depends on what it says, right? If he is legislating a new rule restricting gun ownership, the president can't legislate by executive order. If he is exercising something, some authority that has already been conferred upon him by statute in some sense, he's adopting an interpretation or an enforcement practice of an existing statutory authority, he can probably do that. If he's making a symbolic statement, that might be you know, sort of signaling, as David Strauss has said, um, but there's no reason the president can't signal and say, you know, say things of why the president can't speak. Um, so the validity of any executive order depends on what the executive order says and does and whether it falls within an existing presidential power or delegated authority or not. Well, since we are almost at 6 p.m. or just now at 6 p.m., I'd just ask either of you if you have any closing remarks that you'd like to offer. Mike, no, go ahead. somebody to tell us about uh, California's executive <laughs> order status. And uh, we have Michael McConnell here, a <laughs> situated Stanford. No, but I will say that the last question is much harder than either of you make it out to be because if, if, if what I read is accurate, uh, what Biden is going to do is require uh, background checks for uh, so-called ghost guns, which have not been defined as weapons. And so what that must mean is that he's going to tell the BATF to change the, the longstanding, its longstanding definition of a statutory term. And since um, okay, the authority of agencies to change longstanding definitions of statutory terms depends in part on whether they are being done, that change is being done on the basis of some kind of exercise of expertise. Uh, I would think that if they're being ordered to do it by the White House for policy reasons, that may weaken their ability to be able to defend uh, the action uh, when it actually goes to court. So uh, I, it may be that President Biden gets his public relations benefit at the cost of weakening his uh, legal case, which is ha which happened with Trump a number of times. Uh, a lot of the of the things that were struck down were things that were perfectly lawful, but because Trump uh, <laughs> told them to do them for for the in legally indefensible reasons, they got struck down in court. Uh, but anyway, th to our time is up. Thank you to both of you. I thought that was great. Um, a uh, really interesting uh, exchange. And uh, I, uh, so please, I, if we were in person, I would uh, stand up and ask everyone in the crowd to, <laughs> to join me in giving you a round of applause. So I got, um, you can do that virtually, I suppose. Uh, so thank you. And our next constitutional conversation is next week, next Tuesday, April 13th. Uh, distinguished historian Sean Willens. Uh, will be talking to us about the history of conspiracy theories uh, in America. So uh, uh, please uh, uh, join us for that. And, and again, thank you, Michael. Thank you, David, for a, a most interesting uh, conversation. Thank you for thank having you me. So long.